Morning, church family. The uh, candles lit this morning. Yeah, praise God. Uh, so Tim Schweer led his uh, buddy Chris to the Lord this week, and he's part of Fight Club also. So way to go, Chris. We're proud of you. We celebrate with you. I uh, also uh, just want to say a word about that men's event. Uh, it's a week from Friday, this coming Friday, and look forward to seeing all of our guys uh, there for that event. As, as men, there are just times we need to gather together for sharpening, for a word just for our guys, a word of challenge and encouragement. So I uh, hope you can be there for that. Um, as a church family, uh, we are working through the book of Romans here together on Sunday morning, as well as in our life groups. And the passage that we are on this week is the last half of Romans 13, uh, verses 8 through 14. And in just a second, I'm going to uh, read that. But uh, first, I, I just want to say I recently heard the testimony of Megan Basham. She's a journalist. She's a, a, the, the culture reporter for the Daily Wire. And her uh, story d- d- sort of struck me this week because of the way that the section of Scripture that we're going to read here in just a moment uh, impacted her life. She had uh, grown up going to church, but at the time of of her conversion, she was sort of living just the wild party life at college. She said that on one particular Sunday night, she was uh, high and hungover, and she was trying rather uncharacteristically to complete an English assignment that evening, and so she was reading a book that had been assigned called The Quest of the Holy Grail. And there is a dialogue in that book between one of the characters named Lancelot and another character called the Hermit. And, it, and the Holy Spirit used this dialogue to sort of shake her awake. Here, here's, here's what she writes. She said, then I read the Hermit's rebuke that said, you stumbled from the path of righteousness and set your feet on one unknown to you till then, the path of lust, the path which degrades both body and soul to a degree that none can really know who has not tried it. She writes, well, I had tried it. Lust for attention, for superiority, lust to feel good. I knew the degradation. My parents were at a Sunday evening church service and their drunken, drug-addicted daughter was sitting on the couch writing a term paper at their house because she knew all too well this sort of degradation. And the book says that at this, Lancelot wept bitterly. And in that moment, I wept along with him. I had been raised a Christian, but I never exhibited the slightest sustained interest in spiritual things that would suggest I was a true disciple. And yet when the hermit offered Lancelot this hope, nonetheless, you have not so offended that you may yet find forgiveness. She says, I, I wanted that forgiveness too. I got down on my knees and I prayed. And the following Sunday, I decided to go to church. And I won't pretend from that day that my battle with substance abuse immediately ended but it actually became a battle at that point. She talks about the greatest weapons being regular Bible study in the community that she found at her new church. But then she writes this. She says, at points during my wasteland years, my parents tried to help me as best as they could. I went to rehab, I I spent months with therapists. But she says, but what I found was that focusing just on my past my childhood experiences, some traumas that had happened to me, did nothing in the long run to help break the stranglehold of my sin. She said, it was only when I encountered clear scripture and clear teaching that challenged me to not focus simply on how I had been wronged, but rather to repent for the wrongs that I had committed, that I was able to find lasting victory. She says, scriptures that say things like abstain from fleshly lusts, flee immorality. She writes, what could be more direct? Do you want to put to death the lusts in your heart, the scriptures say, then stop entertaining them. Scriptures like Romans 13, 14 that said, make no provision for the flesh. 
and how to buffet my body and control its desires. She says, I had been immersed in church subculture my entire life, but all of this was a revelation to me. I had never heard the clarity of scripture applied to my habitual drunkenness and drug use. And for me in that moment, it was the power of God. She said, I stopped caring so much about how I had been injured because I was busy serving and being sanctified. I was busy being grateful. And for the first time, I was free indeed. You know, our particular struggles and circumstances may not be exactly like Megan's, but we also, I need it and you need it. We need the clarity We need the simplicity. We need the urgency of this passage that we're about to read just as much as Megan did in her life. So let me read it. Uh, Romans uh, 13, starting in verse eight. Here's the word of God. Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. For the commandments say, you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to others, so love fulfills the requirements of God's law. And this is all the more urgent for you know how late it is. Time is running out. So wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We ask that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things in it and that the Holy Spirit would apply it to us as we need it in Jesus' name. So how does God change me? How does God change any of us? How does God transform us? I want to take just the next few minutes and just point out the four commands, the four exhortations that are in this passage that we just read because they put us on the path forward to real life change, okay? And here's the first command that we get from the scripture that we read. It's a command we've heard before, and yet it's a command we must hear again and again and again because it is the central theme of the Christian life. And the exhortation that we get, number one, is to love always. It's the first thing he mentions. He begins by saying, owe nothing to anyone accept your obligation to love one another. You know, he's saying, you should make good on all of your debts. You should make good on all of your obligations. But he says the one obligation that you will never be free from is the obligation to love other people. And he says the reason that we will never be free of this obligation is because love is the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament law. Its purpose, its goal, everything in it points to this summary keystone command to love others as we love ourselves. And then he lists these uh, four commandments from the Ten Commandments uh, as examples. You know, don't commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. He says, love will never lead you to do those things. Because all of those things wrong another person. And love, by its very definition, only does good to someone. It doesn't wrong someone. So love will never lead you to do those things. He says, love, then, it is the capstone ethic. It is the evidence 
of God's Spirit at work in us, that the Holy Spirit is always leading us in that direction to think less of me and to think more of others, and that to grow in faith is to grow in love. If I'm not growing in love, I'm not growing in my faith either. And I've had to confront this in myself over and over and over again, because maybe, maybe I can say, oh, maybe I'm growing in knowledge, or maybe I'm growing in, in skill in one way or another, but am I growing in love? Am I a more loving person than I was last year? Am I really learning to sacrifice for others and to put them ahead of myself at a deeper level? Am I really, am I growing in love? You know, when a baby comes into the world, by its very nature, it has no concern for others. It's focused, an infant is focused solely and only on its own needs. But slowly and with parenting, a child learns to consider brother or sister. It learns to consider uh, playmates. It learns to consider schoolmates as it, as it gets older and even into adulthood, you know, learning to consider the needs of one's spouse and children and on and on, right? That's the process of, of growth. And similarly, when we are born again by the Spirit of God, we are a spiritual infant in the sense that we are just beginning our journey to love others as Christ loves me. And for a time, it is quite natural in the Christian life that we need to focus on our own growth. We need to focus on our own healing. And that's perfectly appropriate for a season. The problem, though, occurs when we get stuck there. You know, in Megan's testimony, we read just a little bit of it, she said that she had gone to therapist after therapist, but what she was realizing is that she was only focusing on herself and real transformation didn't start until she learned to lift her eyes up from herself and up to the Lord Jesus Christ and out to other people. And that's when change began to occur. And we can recognize that, in this, but at the same time understand there is a place for doing the hard work on the inside. There is a place for healing. There is a place for shining the light of the gospel on our own soul, doing that hard work on the inside. Uh, the thing is, is that we don't want to stay there. We don't want to get stuck there because discipleship that doesn't lead me and push me to love other people at a deeper level cannot be true Christian discipleship because love is the capstone ethic of the Christian life. So am I growing in love? And that's why God is always putting these situations in our life to stretch us and teach us to love other people. You know, when you get married, you have to learn to consider the needs of your spouse ahead of your own. You know, perhaps children come, and now you're learning uh, how to give of yourself at a whole different level than you ever thought that you could. Maybe you're promoted at work, and now you must learn to really care for, genuinely love this team that you have learning to forgive people who have hurt me, you know, learning to love my enemy, learning to care for my parents as they age, learning to give and to serve in the local church. There's, uh, we never stop this journey of learning to love. And God is always putting these new situations in our life to help us to do that. And so, the question is, as we think about our own transformation, when we think about the change that's needed in our life, am I growing in love? Where is he stretching me in my life right now? Because true change will come as I lift my eyes just from my own hurts and I lift them up to love other people. Sometimes the very thing I need in my journey of recovery, the very thing that I need to grow in Christ is to learn to serve other people and love other people. And that's where the shift 
will occur. And that is what Paul exhorts us to here, to grow in love. Here's the second exhortation that he gives us. And it is this, to wake up, to wake up. Verse 11 says, this is all the more urgent, okay? Uh, to live a life of love. Uh, this is all the more urgent for you know how late it is that time is running out. Wake up for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Wake up. When I'm asleep physically, I'm not aware of my surroundings, right? I'm not perceiving things that are going on around me. I am not active. I am not working. And Paul is saying we can be asleep spiritually. I may be saved. I may have the Holy Spirit within me, but I have been lulled to sleep spiritually by the endless entertainment that is around me and, and the temptations of the world. When I'm asleep spiritually, I am just moving mindlessly with the culture. I'm not aware of the urgency of the hour. I give in to sin with little to no resistance. There is no action. There is no vitality. There is no active mindset. There is no urgency to gear up and to grow up. I am listless, spiritually asleep. And into that, Paul says, wake up because Jesus is at the door. It is the last watch of the night. The sun is almost here. The son of God is almost here. And soldiers in a patrol base know that the hour before dawn is the most dangerous hour because it is that hour when the enemy attacks, because it is so hard to stay awake in that hour before dawn. And Paul is saying, you are in a battle. You are in the last watch of the night. Wake up and be alert to what's going on around you, because your salvation is nearer now than when you first believed. Now, you might hear that phrase that my salvation is nearer now than when I first believed and say, no, wait, what's he talking about? I thought I was saved. I thought I was saved when I put my trust in, in Jesus. Why is he talking about salvation as, as something in the future? And it's important to understand that the Bible talks about salvation in three different ways, okay? One is in the past. When you believed, when you put your faith in Jesus, you were saved from the penalty of sin right in that moment. But the Bible also says we are working out our salvation as we work to be free of the power of sin. And that when Jesus returns, our salvation will finally be complete when we are free from the presence of sin altogether. And that's the sense in which he is using it here. And he says each passing moment is making it closer. Are you ready? It was interesting to me that God used this book, this English assignment to wake Megan up in that moment. And some of us today, we need to wake up. I'm tolerating sin. I'm, a, I'm, I'm allowing it in my life. I am just stumbling through life with no spiritual vitality. And Paul is saying, I need to see the battle. I need to see what is at stake. I'm, gonna, I'm in danger of losing my family. I'm gonna lose my respect. I'm gonna lose my witness. Wake up, wake up because the hour of Jesus's return is near. So he says, love always, wake up. And when I wake up, it is then that I can do the third command that's in this passage. And that is to put off sin and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what he uh, says here, just to remind us of it. Verse 12, the night's almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes 
and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. So don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he uses this metaphor, right, of, of, of clothing. Uh, and he says, put off uh, the old dirty clothes and put on the shining new clothes for all to see. He's saying that when we come to Christ, there are old habits we must put off and there are new habits that we must put on. And he says it, he's reminding us that this is not something passive, you know, that there's just a lightning bolt that comes down and suddenly we're free from all those old habits. No, he's saying because you're free, because you are now dead to sin, because Christ is in your heart, now you can put your shoulder into the effort because you will be successful. God will enable you to be successful. And he gives a few examples of, of things that we should put off, right? He says wild parties, drunkenness, immorality. He says, put all that kind of stuff off. And the reason he lists those in particular is because these were temptations to the Roman Christians because they were all associated with pagan idol worship. It was part of their culture. All of those things happen with pagan idol worship. Paul is saying, resist that. No longer participate in that. That's something that you should put off. And then he mentions quarreling and jealousy. And we know as we read on in Romans that that was something the Roman church was struggling with. Pride, division, quarreling among one another. He says, put that off in your relationships. That's part of the old nature. That's not something you should have anymore. But even as these were temptations in, in the Roman culture, they are just as much as temptations for us today. I mean, do we deal with pride and quarreling and division in our relationships? Yeah, yeah, we do. Do we deal with the temptations of, of sexual immorality, pornography, all of that kind of stuff? Oh yeah, our culture is saturated with it, right? Or uh, quarreling and uh, jealousy and, 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 and all of those things are substance abuse. Yes, huge issues in our culture. And what's interesting to me when I read this is Paul doesn't dwell on it too long. He basically just says, stop it. <laughs> These are things you should no longer be doing. And, it's, and I think what we need reminded of here is that sin has bullied us into thinking that we have no choice. It has bullied us into thinking that it, it has control over us and we have to obey it. We're still in bondage to it, but we're not. We need to be encouraged that Christ has freed us. He has freed us and we now have agency to say, I will not any longer be a part of that. And of course, we just can't put something off. We have to put something else on. And he says, put on the shining armor of right living. Put on the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in its place. What does that mean? How do I put on the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ? And of course, what he means by that is put on the righteousness of Christ. Put on the character of Christ. So now in place of those old things, I put on love for others. I put on kind and good actions. I put on joy and peace in adversity. I put on honesty instead of lying and deceit. I put on encouraging words out of my mouth rather than things that tear others down. I put on generosity. I put on humility. 
I put on the character of Christ. And so in the Lord, every day, I can say, I am putting off this and I am putting on that. I will not do that. (laughs) I will do this because the Holy Spirit has enabled me. And we should find this freeing and we should find this powerful. The confidence that I gain when I just punch sin in the nose and say, I will not do it. And it stumbles back just like a bully in the playground. So surprised that you have stood up to it for the first time and said, no, I, I, that will no longer be a part of my life. And it's, it's shocked that you're telling it no. And you all of a sudden gain this new confidence. Oh, well, Christ has freed me. He has enabled me. I do have agency to put off the old and to put on the new. And it realizes, the sin nature realizes the gig is up. It can no longer dominate you and control you like it once did. We put off and we put on. And here's the last command in this section that we read. And it is to stop feeding the flesh. Stop feeding it. The last half of verse 14 says, don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Don't let yourself think. Don't let yourself think about it. You know, the old, the old translations say, don't make provision for the flesh. Now I'm gonna state the obvious here, which is that you and I, Uh, have desires that are not good, right? We have desires that are not good. Welcome to the human race, okay? We have immorality, lust, substance abuse, the desire for hate or power or greed or pride or selfishness or laziness. We all struggle with desire that is not good. We cannot control that. What I can control is whether I feed it or not, right? I can choose to stop entertaining it and indulging it in my thought life. I can stop giving it headspace. That's what this scripture is talking about. Martin Luther, said it this way, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from nesting in your hair, okay? What he's, you get what he's saying. He's saying you can't, you can't stop thoughts from coming into your head, but you don't have to entertain them. You don't have to indulge them. That's a choice that we make to do that. And he's saying, not anymore. Stop feeding it. Stop indulging it. Stop making opportunities for it. You know, as an old, uh, old cowboy said, if you're given to drink, then why are you hitching your horse in front of the saloon, right? Uh, I, you can't, I take in racy media content and then I wonder why I'm struggling with lust. That's the idea here. We're giving it space. We're giving it opportunity. And he says, quit it. <laughs> quit doing that. And so this is, a, this is a call for you and I to change what I watch, to change where I go, to change who I hang with, to change what I dwell on. And when the bird flies over my head, I take that thought captive and I redirect it. And what's happening as I am doing that is I am starving the flesh. And then what I need to do is turn and feed the spirit. Starve the flesh and feed the spirit by putting new things into my life, right? Like church. 
Don't you feel better when you're at church, right? We have God's presence. We have the encouragement of one another. We worship. We sit under the word. We're encouraged when we leave. We're strengthened. We fed the spirit for the week ahead. As you get into God's word, as you fellowship with other believers in a small group, as you do all of these things, you are feeding the spirit. And so you see the power as you begin to starve out the flesh because you're not indulging it anymore and you're feeding the spirit, that transformation is coming because God has enabled you to do that. So how can I change? (laughs) We know the first step is to trust Jesus with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength to trust him because we have no power in our flesh uh, to overcome the dominion of sin, to overcome the bondage of sin. We cannot do it on our own. We have to, like Megan did on that Sunday night, reading that assignment, we come under the conviction and say, God, what am I doing? What am I doing? Uh, And to fully trust the Lord and his death for us, because only he, Only he can free us from the dominion of sin. Only he can give us a new heart. We can't do it ourselves. And then we do what the scriptures say, what we just read. We we stop focusing on ourselves and we start loving others. We begin to love and to serve and to give and to care. And that is the central focus of the Christian life. As we do that, the power of sin is being broken. We wake up, we wake up and quit sleepwalking through life. We get shaken awake and then we put off the old and put on the new. You know, we punch the bully in the nose on that one. You have been enabled. So we put on those new things and put off the old. And then we stop feeding the flesh and feed the spirit. And the encouragement here is that as we do these things, God will change us. That's how he changes us. And so the question is, will I obey him in these things? Even this week, would I do it? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I just, I thank you so much for this awesome church. I thank you for what every person in this room means to me and to my family. We thank you for the word of God, which convicts us and encourages us at the same time. Lord, thank you. Thank you for that. And we just ask here together as a church family, Lord, we tell you that we want to change and grow. We don't want to be the same person that we were a year ago, two years ago. We want to be on that track of growth. We want to be that pure and spotless bride when you return. And so would you wake us up from our slumber? Shake us awake. Lord, show us today how you have given us the power to put off old things and to put on new. And I don't have to let the bully of sin intimidate me any longer. And Lord, I commit today in my heart and spirit that I'm gonna quit indulging and entertaining all of these desires of my flesh. I don't have to do that anymore. And I wanna starve it rather than entertain it. And I wanna feed my spirit And as I sow these new practices into my life, you are changing me by your power. Lord, I wanna pray for those among us today who have not yet put their whole faith in Jesus Christ to free them from the power of sin. I've been around the edges of it, talking about it here and there, but I want to be free and I cannot be free on my own. It only comes from bowing the knee to Christ the Lord. 
And so right where you are today, right in your seat, you say, God, I surrender myself fully, wholly, and completely to you. I repent of my sin. I take your blood that, to cover my sin. And by faith, I bridge that gap to have a new relationship with you. And you are changing my life and you are changing my heart right now as I do that. Praise God. Lord, thank you for the miracle that you're doing in each of our lives. We love you so much. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Hey, if you said yes to God today, just stop by the yes table on your way out. They've got a gift for you. would love to encourage you any way that they can. And if, if you need prayer uh, for any reason, we're always down front uh, to pray with you. And, and, and so feel free to do that as well. Let's stand together and we'll go out with a song.